In den letzten Wochen hat sich der LinkedIn-Algorithmus komplett verändert und dies wurde zum ersten Mal jetzt in einem umfangreichen Report mit Zahlen, Daten und Fakten bestätigt. Der LinkedIn-Experte Richard van der Blom aus Holland hat auf 123 Seiten dokumentiert, was in den letzten Wochen mit dem Algorithmus passiert ist und Empfehlungen abgegeben, worauf es jetzt ankommt. Und das habe ich als Anlass genommen, um Richard für ein Interview zu buchen, um ihn wirklich fast eine Stunde auszufragen, worauf es jetzt im Content ankommt, welche großen Chancen er sieht, um so schnell wie möglich zu wachsen und vor allem, was man jetzt über den Algorithmus wissen muss. Wenn dich diese Themen interessieren, dann sieh dir das Video unbedingt bis zum Ende an. Da sind unglaublich viele spannende kleine Tricks, Hacks drin, die ich selbst noch nicht kannte. Und wenn du mir einen kleinen Gefallen tust, dann like dieses Interview. Das würde mich extrem freuen, um das Video ordentlich zu pushen. Und jetzt wünsche ich mir ganz viel Spaß mit dem neuen Interview. I am super excited about this interview. I think Richard, uh, whole LinkedIn was expecting your report on the new algorithm. And I was super excited to read it through, uh, see a lot of stuff that I realized in the last couple of weeks. And I'm super excited to discuss a lot of things that were into in this report. So happy to have you here. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Robert. Thank you. Um, so the first question is maybe the most tricky one, but I'm really curious about it because I was trying to find a headline for the recent algorithm to make it really simple for the people to really on the, on the meta, uh, yeah, like on the first level to explain what happened. Do you find, did you find for yourself some kind of headline in terms of, I don't know, the reach decreased, but here are some good news. Do you have anything? Wow, that's a, that's a very uh, original <laughs> question. I hadn't, I hadn't prepared for that one. Um, no, no, I don't have like the killer headline that like summarizes the conclusions of the report. I think for two reasons. Uh, first of mm -hmm. all, this report has been more extended and more data and more different topics than any other previous reports we published. So... Yeah. It, it would have been something that we could have done like four years ago, but now well, I, I don't know where to start. I don't, I don't know what to emphasize. Uh, second reason is that um, we needed to stay away from anything that um, could cause, uh, how do you say that? Uh, it's like an oversimplification of the, of the topic. Yeah, so 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 if I would say like like a title like I don't know, reach down but engagement is up, I yeah. mean that's oversimplified and that wouldn't do right to all the details that are in the in the in the report. There's another thing that we needed to stay away from everything that was related to LinkedIn because mm -hmm. the LinkedIn legal department reached out to us and they were not quite happy about the report because they said like people think that it comes from us or people think that it's uh, LinkedIn related. And, you know, I said, it's not, nobody, everybody knows that I'm not working at LinkedIn, but we had this huge disclaimer and I needed to like do a lot of official things. Um, so, so that's also why we stayed away from anything with LinkedIn and a headline. And so that's why it's yeah. called algorithm insight report and not LinkedIn algorithm report. Uh -huh. Oh, that is some juicy stuff right at the beginning, Richard. I love it. So you got yeah. so much attention of the platform that they really like, are like, ah, we got to be careful what he's like publishing there. It, it's two things. So basically our last report, uh, October 2022, got a lot of exposure, uh, over yeah. 4 million views on LinkedIn. And actually it has been used by LinkedIn's own employees, especially the ones that need to guide their paying customers to more success. Uh, and yeah. they have been sharing this report with their clients, okay? And okay. I think way, way, way at the top of LinkedIn, they were not quite happy that they were using like external <laughs> reports uh, for their clients. Yeah. So that was the first thing. Second thing is that LinkedIn started last summer yeah. with a quest to go after professionals that have LinkedIn related services that they needed to be compliant with their brand and trademark policy, which of course is their right. That's why you see a lot of people now with the LinkedIn trademark symbol 
and yeah. with the official disclaimers, a lot of people at the moment are changing titles from their podcasts, from their yeah. LinkedIn lives, from their books, because LinkedIn doesn't want the official yeah. trademark or the official name to be associated yeah. with anything that's not directly from them themselves. Okay, got it. Okay, so we got this out of the way, but it was uh, worth a shot to try to find a headline for the changes. Impossible. I got it. No, something that I really realized was that in the last like two months, I think it started that my reach and my content really like changed. We had a content strategy for over, I think, three years that we focused on the combination of social content. So like personal content with storytelling and like expert content where we talk about our topics. And in the last like two or three months, it really changed that my professional or expert content really started to get some reach that it never had before. And mm -hmm. my social content dropped like 50%, but the engagement mm -hmm. stayed the same. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting because that was an observation for me that it makes totally sense that LinkedIn decreases it's like the social stories and pushes a little bit more like the, um, the professional content. Is this something that you found in your report like is it a shift to more professional content? Um, except from what we found in the report, what you have noticed is something that was announced in June. Like by, a year ago or something almost, yeah, in right? June. Yeah, June, LinkedIn chief editor, uh, Daniel Roth, he said that they were going to show more personal related content to your connections and yeah. more thought leadership content to your followers. And because your followers in general are much more active with your content than your connection, that's something that a lot of people don't realize, but your followers yeah. are normally much more engaging than your connection because for example, my connections are also people I met like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, like, like former colleagues, but they don't necessarily are interested in my content. But people who have recently started to follow me, they follow me because they want to see my content. So they didn't say like the more expert content we are going to shift to your followers and the more personal content we are going to shift to your um, connections. Um, uh, so it's something that should have happened because it was announced. Um, what we see in general is that reach has declined also on expert content. It has mm -hmm. declined somewhere between 25-40%, while the engagement for a lot of content stays the same. So you get less reach, yeah. but you get the same amount of comments and likes. Um, I, I think it has something to do with, like during the pandemic and also the year after, we had a lot of personal stories. Everybody was sharing these things from at home. So yeah. that really topped like the feed. And I think they just switched the button down and said like, okay, we're a professional network. So we <laughs> turn down the professional, the personal stories and we emphasize more the expert content. So that makes sense to me as well. Happy to hear that because it was for, for us and a lot of our clients, a gut feeling that they're shifting this. And I remember that they really announced it in June and nothing happened yes. for a couple of months. And I no. was like, okay, they're saying something and nothing happening. And then it was happening. And I was like, okay, that's great news because I think it's way easier to stand out with good expert content if you're really good in your area besides like coming up with great stories every time it's it's, it's so first of all the, the the what was announced in june is something we saw end of september start of october that was when mm -hmm. the algorithm really started to shift um and except from your expert content standing out i mean it's also a fact that, especially last year, the beginning of the year, my, my feed was flooded with irrelevant selfies and people saying, <laughs> I had a burnout, I went on holiday to Hawaii, and now I yeah. earn a six-figure month income. You know, that, that was more or less, or I, I was an alcoholic, I saw the light, and now I have a successful gin tonic business, something like yeah. that. And it was completely <laughs> full of those kind of stories. And I was like, okay. Yeah. I can do with less of those stories and I can do with a bit more of like in-depth content. So I think it's, yeah. it's for the good final uh, in the end. 
I'm absolutely with you that it's for the good. And I think it's for the platform for the good. So the, the clients that we have are most of the time, like founders and like CEOs of startups and smaller companies, and they have really limited time. And I asked them before I did this interview with you, like, what should I ask Richard? Yeah, I have a limited uh, amount of questions. What should I ask? And I uh, see this uh, picture of the different types of like formats. Is it documents, text and image? Do I text only? Do I do an article? Do you have some suggestion for people that like post like three times a week, what to focus on? Or maybe is it something that you change since you did this report change on your own like content strategy to emphasize one thing that is better that you would change? No, the, the only thing I'm really aware of, and you can see it if, for example, you check my last 10 posts, I think you will see five different formats. Mm -hmm. You will see like document posts, you will see a video, you will see a text only post, you will see polls. Um, so one of the conclusions from a report is that people who mix up the formats of their content get better impressions than if you say like, nah, I only do text plus plus uh, one image. Like I, mm -hmm. I keep doing text plus one image. So it's like yeah. almost like LinkedIn or your audience is getting bored of the same stuff over and over. But if they That's see hi, today a video, tomorrow a document post, the day after a poll, you mix the formats, you get better results. Um, mm -hmm. That's a thing that I'm more aware of than before we released the report. So I'm really thinking, for example, this morning I had um, a GIF um, because I wanted to post a document post, but yesterday was a document post. So I, I, I kept my document post, for example, for tomorrow. If you look at all the stats we have in the reports, I mean, there are like almost 25 pages about the different formats yeah. and what is the ideal if you publish text only a video. I'm going to be very honest. I know it, but I still write on my intuition rather than with a checklist. So yeah. if it says like a text only post should have ideally 2,400 characters. I know it needs to be longer than average, but I'm not going to count. <laughs> and if I have 1,800 yeah. or 3,000, I still post it. So, and that's also my advice to people say like, wow, this is a lot. And how do you implement this? It's more about awareness that if you do different things that maybe you should adapt your strategy, but for God's sake, please use your intuition and keep, and also keep observing what works for you. I mean, yeah. what works for me could not work for you or the other way around. So that, that's even more important. But I really like it because I was, I got really lazy in the last three or five years. I found my winning formula with like a text and a personal image and it worked really well. And I spiced it up a little bit sometimes with a carousel or a document or with, I don't know, a video, but to emphasize it, to really like do some like different uh, formats every week because I think it's some kind of maybe content fatigue that people always see the same and it's always something interesting when week after week something new happens or, or day after day that's really a good finding I but think. but but your conclusion is spot on because a lot of people say it's the algorithm that doesn't like you to publish five text yeah. posts in a row I I seriously doubt if it's the algorithm I think it's the human behavior I think if people always see the same type of post from Robert after yeah. three days seeing your personal image with a story, they go like, ah, that's another story. Let's, let, let's scroll. <laughs> but if they yeah. see then a PDF or a video, they stop and they, they're going yeah. to check it out. So I think it's more the human audience that influences the algorithm. But, you know, it, it makes sense because some people like just to watch a video. They don't like to read. Or some people don't like to go to 16 slides. They just want to have one story. So you mixing up your content and presented in different ways probably resonates with a bigger audience than just having one like preferred format that you're, you're going to use. Love it. I'm taking this away from this interview already. And another thing that I realized that was really interesting, I w I'm always looking all for the last years, I was always looking like which post hit like 10,000 or more views. That was always like a, a like success formula for me. What is it? And really in the last like two or three months, I was really struggling to see a pattern because it was social content. It was expert content and was all the different stuff. And two things stood out and maybe you can say something about you know, on your report. First, uh, first thing was really the headline was stronger than ever. It was really like 
in your face. I think I'm pretty good at headlines, but these headlines were really like, okay, they're hitting pretty hard. And the uh, second thing that I was observing was that the comment section was crowded like never before on these posts. So I have way longer comments and all the posts that really hit 10,000 views, they had like 100, 150, 200 like quality comments. Is this something we should focus on more to get really like quality discussions on the on the posts? So to start with the, the second conclusion, uh, yes, that's, that's also stated in the, in the report. So what LinkedIn wants to happen on the platform is discussions, conversations. That's, that mm -hmm. should be the goal of your content. Like, yeah. I think probably we want people to go from our content to a profile and, and I don't know, contact or buy something, but LinkedIn's interest is to have more conversations, discussions. So if you get a post that gets a lot of indirect comments, indirect comments means a comment on another comment. Okay, so comment uh, threads. Ooh indirect yeah, comments. Yeah. If you get a lot of those, that's really an acceleration of your growth of your of your post. So one of the tactics we have been doing ourselves and we're also teaching our clients is you create a post, but instead of putting 100% of your insights in the in the post, you put like 80% mm -hmm. of your insights in the post, then go to the comments and you leave one or two comments with additional insights. So now people can not only comment on the on the post, but can also start to comment on your comment, creating those mini threads, which will accelerate your growth. So definitely indirect comments are very important. Love it, Richard. Give me more of that stuff. Yeah. Never heard that before. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> no. And the first thing you said, it's, it's something that is really difficult to measure yeah. because what's the definition of a good hook? I mean, yeah, you're right. maybe you say like, I wrote a very strong hook yeah. and I go like, nah, for me, that doesn't do it, but <laughs> it's true that the more people that click on see more because LinkedIn only shows the first three lines, the more people that click on see more, the more acceleration you will get. And when do people click on see more when the first two sentences make sense or are painful or are triggering or make them curious. So I think the most important part of your post is your hook because that's, where people decide whether to read it, check it out or continue scrolling. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. And these indirect comments, I really never heard that term. And that is really interesting because I was always like, the people are commenting and I'm saying thank you and that's it. And I started realizing that and starting conversation beneath uh, already these comments and I saw this traction and that was really interesting. One part that I found in your report that was really interesting and stood out for me was this engagement impact ratio on own posts where you have like one like and a comment is like 15 points and a repost is like 10 points. Does that really mean that one comment is like worth 15 likes? No. Uh, yes, yes. Sorry. No, no. Yes. The, the impact, <laughs> sorry, the impact yeah. of one comment yeah. on the growth of your post is more or less Equals. the same than 15 likes. So a like for me is like, a like is, is how people greet each other. Like you yeah. see somebody, you say, hey, everything okay? Yes, everything okay. And we move on. It's, it's not a substantial action. But a comment is when you greet someone and say, hey, Robert, it's been a long time. What have you been up to? Tell me more. So that's really interest. With a like is something that I do if I think ah, this person ex like expects me to engage, but I really don't like the content that much. So I give him <laughs> a like, you know, like I, yeah. I've done my etiquette. Yeah. But a comment is so much more powerful. A repost as well, because a repost, I tell LinkedIn, show this original post to my network. So that means that I feel that it's worth sharing with my network. So the two biggest accelerators that you can get on your own post is when people comment on your post or when people repost your post. That's really interesting because I think they have like, yeah, I think it's a little bit like on YouTube where they're optimized for watch time. And I think it's on LinkedIn, like discussion time. I think there is more value when people really engage and comment on each other's posts. And that's really interesting because I have the feeling maybe you still remember the data from your report before. Did this change? Did comments like go up in the impact of growth or did it stay the same? Because I always no, I, had the feelings, 
but I never saw the data no, for it. No, it has always, been, well, always, I don't know. But since we yeah. did the report, I remember from the first report in 2019 that comments were like eight times stronger as likes, something like or seven okay. times stronger. So it yeah. was already that a comment, I, and, and it makes sense because if I write a comment, the engagement is stronger because I give my opinion or I give an insight or I ask a question. What I like is just like, it's like just a click. It's nothing more. Um, but the difference between the impact of a like and a comment has like grown further apart. Like a comment has now like much more power than, than a like. Yeah. And I really like your explanation, like that you greet people and say hi, and that's it. And I have the feeling that people are really like liking a lot of stuff, but to go really into a post, uh, take the time to read it and comment is really something else. And it's really nice to see that LinkedIn like prefers it and gives you more growth. One thing that I really am interested is in that I saw in the last years that you always came up with if the first hour is really good and you get a lot of traction. It's really like your, your post is, is set up for success over the day. And I heard this, that it really changed, that it's not really like this golden hour anymore, that it spreads over the day. Do you have something like an indication how long a post works? And I also saw some data that you said that posts are getting also on the second day or on the third day, some yeah. visibility. Can you yeah. say something about this? Yeah. So the difference between uh, the last report, October 2022, so that's like 15 months ago, is that back then 85% of your reach, your impressions, um, you would get on your first day. So that means that only 50% would come from second, third, and, and so on. So so like almost all the engagement, all the reach comes from the first day. Now it's like 70%, 70, which means 30% comes from your second and third day. Okay, so, so posts do have a longer lifespan. Um, I still believe that the first hour is very important because mm -hmm. if in the first hour your post doesn't fly, it's very difficult to catch up over time and get yeah. the same reach compared to if your post gets a lot of traction in the first hour. So I always advise people, you know, make sure that when you post, your audience is live, um, stick with the same posting time. That's also, I, I always post between eight and nine in the morning. And it's not only that you train the algorithm to bring traffic at that moment to your post, but you also train your human audience. I have really people, believe it or not, that sent me a message at 9.30 on LinkedIn and say, hey, did I miss your post today? And I go like, no, no, <laughs> really? like, I, yeah, 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 yeah. 9.30, if I haven't post, I get on average five to six DMs from people saying, yeah. hey, did I miss your post today? So people are waiting. Richard, and, you're late today. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 Where's exactly, your post? Exactly. <laughs> exactly, no, because imagine all the people that, that if they if they ring your bell, they get the notification, no? Yeah. And they are used to probably with their cup of coffee or tea or whatever or their breakfast to see the bell and say Richard published this post between eight and nine. So if they don't yeah. see it, they go like, "Hey, did I miss it?" And then I go like, "No, sorry, I'm late today." But I, so I always try to stick between eight and nine. Uh, so you train the algorithm, you train your human audience, you get more reach, and I really focus on being present around the moment that I publish. So I don't post and ghost. It's not that I open my laptop, I create my post and I close my laptop. No, I'm engaging with other content creators. I'm engaging with the first 10 to 15 comments I get. I, I add two additional comments of my own to get the indirect comments. So it's like more like half an hour that I'm there when I publish in my content. That's oh, that's perfect for my next question, because if you're really busy and you don't have a lot of time and you maybe have half an hour a day to spend time on the platform, not doing the content, but do like stuff like this. Is it the half hour that you would invest when you post like your post and be around, like start commenting on other creators posts? If you, uh, if you only have half an hour a day, I would do it differently. Then I would say, okay, around the moment that you post, Five minutes prior to you to your own post, you start engaging, mm -hmm. you publish your post, and you stay ten minutes around. So that's fifteen minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then, like I don't know, probably four hours later, I would check in for five minutes, select a few comments, and respond to those comments. Okay. And mm -hmm. I would do the same 
like eight hours after I publish. So at the end of my working day, I would go back in 10 minutes and look at some interesting comments to like respond to. So I would then, if I have half an hour, I would do 50 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. Because if you only do it at the beginning and you get more comments yeah. and you stop engaging with the comments, you see that the growth will be like flatter, okay? So it's yeah. very important that you like nurture your own post during the first day. That's really good to hear and that you really like take some time over the whole day to engage yes. with the comments and that people really, yeah, send, can see that you're active. So from a growing perspective in terms of like uh, followers on LinkedIn, do you have like, do you have like a strategy or tactics on your mind to say, hey, how can I grow my followers in 2024? What are like your core strategies? Because for example, I talked to Jay Alec um, and he was really like on commenting a lot with the right people. Uh, he was less on the content side. I talked to Justin Welch and he was less on the commenting side, more on the Monica. good content side. And it was really interesting to see. Do you have your own formula for, for growth that you can share? I, I, it's not that I have a winning formula. So I noticed that, especially the last two years, um, I remember August, August 22. Mm -hmm. I remember that uh, my girlfriend bought me a big balloon uh, saying 50K followers. And yeah. we were in a bar in Valencia because I said to her, wow, I'm going to cross 50,000 followers. And she went out, didn't know what she went to do. And she bought me a balloon. And I even posted a picture on LinkedIn with the balloon, like, like yeah. being a happy child, 50,000. <laughs> so 50,000 followers. I'm on LinkedIn since 2005. So it took me like 17 years to get 50,000 followers. Great. But in the last 18 months, I grew 120,000 followers in addition. So I'm really like accelerating. Um, for me, it's a combination. So first of all, at the moment, we still have creator mode. So I notice when I switch creator mode on and I have the follow button instead of the connection button that I, I grew like five times faster because now the primary action for people is to follow and not to connect. And, and it's I easier don't for, for the people, right? Yeah. Exactly. And also yeah. don't forget that a lot of people, they don't find the connect button. They don't click on more <laughs> and go for connect. So they just yeah. say follow and they think ah, I can only follow this guy. Follow. Okay. So... That was one of the things. So if you write good content and people want to connect with you, but you present the follow button, you get like five times more followers compared to connections. And then I think, well, it's easy, no? Because you said Justin says uh, uh, <laughs> uh, publishing content. Jay says uh, commenting. I think it's the mix that does yeah. the work. Um, I do not comment. No, I do not publish the same amount of content than Justin. I do not have half a million followers. I do definitely not comment as much as Jay does because he comments like like a madman, like 500, yeah. 600 comments a day. Yeah. Uh, and he blocks an hour eh, to do that. He blocks yeah. a complete hour to do that. I don't, I, I cannot block a complete hour of my day. I'm too busy. Um, but I've noticed that consistency in publishing I stepped up my game and I committed to six times a week. That's what I do six times a week. That's so impressive. I noticed yeah. that having six posts a week, different formats, but also different pillars like personal story, thought leadership, industry related, educational posts, all these things I mix up. And now I see that um, I get a lot of followers. It's also that when people are going to be able to use your content and to create their own post and do the mentioning that you get a lot of followers. I'll give you an example. So we published the algorithm report last Monday. Okay. And I know that this post is not going to get the best results because it's 123 pages. You cannot read it on screen. So yeah. probably people are going to save it or people don't know what to do with a 123 page report. So we got, a, I don't know, 80,000 views, which was only 20% of the views we got a year ago. Then I got 400,000 views. So for some reason, LinkedIn really like, I don't know, They're maybe, they, at you. They, yeah. <laughs> maybe they, they turned down the bottom. Then yeah. um, 
when was it Saturday, a guy in Australia creates a text post that started with, I digested a 102, three page report. And this was my takeaways. And it was only a text post, no images, just text. And it was Saturday. I was playing football. I was doing my stuff. I was doing grocery. So I was not in LinkedIn. And I checked LinkedIn in the afternoon. And I saw that I grew 1,500 followers. And I was like, what? Because the days before, I yeah. had, because of the album report, like 200, 300 followers a day. But now I had like 1,500 followers since the last time, four hours before I looked. So I turned to LinkedIn because I needed to know what happened. And it was the text post that six hours after being published already got 4,000 likes and plus 1,000 comments. The guy sent me a print screen. He reached 1.5 million views with the text post that only has six to seven details yeah. of a 123 page report. So this tells me a few things. First of all, People like snackable content. They do not like in-depth content because they don't have the time to digest. They yeah. like, present me the snackable things. Okay, that's the first yeah. thing. Second, um, if you offer people content that they can reshare with their audience because they really like it and they do the proper mentioning, they say like, this was from the report from Richard, then a lot of these people that follow this 1.5 million view post they click on my name and they click on follow because they say, I want to connect with the source. Yeah. So that's also something. And you see a lot of people, for example, also with Jay and Justin, they repurpose the content of Jay and Justin. They, they download a carousel from Jay and they publish it like on their own profile and say, hey, I really love this carousel from Jay because this, this and this. So that means that Jay uh, gets a lot of new followers also from that post. So I think, yeah. so it's, it's publishing, it's commenting, but it's also create content that is easy to share for your audience. And I think the main point is also that you bring something of immense value to the platform and to the people, right? And I think this is something everybody can think about, like your report is maybe not everyone has the time and the, and the resources to do it, but really to publish something where your target audience really like studies this stuff yeah, and thinks that's crazy that I get it for free is something that I think everybody could use as a marketing strategy as well, right? I agree. Although it is, it is diff difficult for a lot of people that I work with. Yesterday I had a call with a, a lady I coach and for her, it's very difficult to find something that she can share that has this unique value because Got it. Um, like you said, you need to have data, you need to have resource, you need to have a very original point of view because otherwise you're just sharing what other people also share. So yeah. um, for me, even for me, like I'm repurposing now some parts of the algorithm report because like I said... I'm trying to make it more snackable for people, yeah. but uh, next to that, it's, it's going to be very hard to have like a more or less comparable piece of content with the same impact because we, we like literally poured everything into this piece of content. Yeah, but I really like this idea of snackable content. I like the term. Yeah, I think it's easy to remember. That's really yeah. cool. And one huge topic a lot of our clients was really concerned about is the topic of uh, AI because they don't really use it to write the post, but they use it like to correct it, to give it some kind of different style. Can you elaborate a little bit on the findings because everybody was concerned now, can't I use like ChatGPT for correcting my post? Where does it detect the difference or does it at all? First of all, the algorithm will probably not detect if you use ChatGPT or AI to like rewrite your profile, uh, your post. For example, I use ChatGPT to correct for grammar. I'm not native English. Uh, I write all my posts and I write the original content directly in English. So I don't write in Dutch and then go to ChatGPT and say translate. No, I write in English. But I always use like, okay, correct for grammar, okay? Because I don't want to make stupid mistakes. Um, so that's the first thing. And I don't think the algorithm will detect that. Also, I use ChatGPT sometimes to get alternatives for my own hook, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I'm not satisfied with the hook, ah, I go yeah, to ChatGPT. I say like, that's my hook. This is the post. 
provide me with three, four, five alternatives in a provocative, funny style, okay? And then I get like some alternatives and it's very often that I combine two of the alternatives and create my own hook, but at least I have some inspiration, okay? So that's why I use ChatGPT. The report says that if you use ChatGPT to write content and without editing, you just uh. publish this content, and especially AI generated comments, okay? Again, it's probably not the algorithm that detects that, but your network will. Uh. I can guarantee you that if I create a post, <laughs> I can directly see yeah. the people who have used yeah. AI to comment because they use words that they normally never, never, like never use. It's, yeah. it's written in a, in a way that I go like, nah, this is not you. This is like <laughs> AI. Um, and what we see in the report is that those comments generate five times less responses from your audience because people know that it's not you. It's like a bot that has done your job. And also AI generated images get six, six or seven times less clicks because people know like, okay, this is AI generated. It's nice, yeah. but I prefer to have some like personal pictures or some like, like, you know, um, homemade images instead of like AI generated. Yeah, it's really funny that you're always thinking about, yeah, the algorithm is detecting this, but just the people and your followers are smart enough to detect it because I always see these comments where it's like an AI comment and I'm like, okay, I got it. Yeah, and I, 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 I think we, I think a lot of people really underestimate the intelligence of their audience. They really think like, hey, I'm going to be a smart ass. I'm going to do this really <laughs> amazing comments and it doesn't yeah. cost me a lot of time. Yeah. But like in a minute, your, your pers the other person knows like, this is not you, Richard, because you don't write these type of words, these type of phrases. Like, um, and the funny thing is, I can really be a pain in the ass if I get those comments because I, I comment on the comment and say like, hey, but what is your own opinion? I don't care about <laughs> what your AI is, is writing. And nobody, nobody of these people, yeah. like, well, maybe one or two, but in general... I get no responses because people feel busted or it's just AI not only writing the comments, but only also ah. selecting the post. So they don't yeah. even know that they are commenting on the post. So they also don't respond. Like it's yeah. gamifying the platform and in the end it will really harm your reputation. Yeah. It's, it's not a success formula. Yeah, that is good that you're also against like all automation stuff. I think you don't, yeah, you don't do yourself a favor with it. Um, no. I'm really curious about some features of LinkedIn that are really not ever used for myself, but I saw that you use it very well and are very familiar with it. Um, can you say something about LinkedIn audio, like use cases? Um, is it... Should I do it? Should I not do it? What should I do in it? Do you have some, some insights about it? Yeah, so we have the report and we have my own experience, which are not like exactly the same. So the report yeah. says that all LinkedIn events, so the LinkedIn Live, but also the LinkedIn Audio get like, I think it's, I don't know the percentage, but get substantially more reach and engagement compared to 15 months ago. Um, because it's live content, It's very interactive, it's engaging, and don't forget, if you have an event, live or audio, and you have, let's say, 500 people signing up, they will get two notifications prior to the event, like remembering them, let's, hey, in, in 24 hours, this event starts, in one hour, this event starts, okay? So LinkedIn is like actually um, sending out notifications to your audience, don't miss the event because you signed up. Once the event starts, Again, LinkedIn sends out a message to all the attendants. Yeah. The event just started. And there are some really cool things that you can do as an organizer. Like, I would never start my event in the first minute directly with the content because uh. people always join in like one or two, three minutes late. So what I do, for example, in the beginning is telling people like, hey, I'm so glad you joined us. We already have 200 people joining. Just put in the chat, where do you join from? So you get mm -hmm. like, Paris, Frankfurt, Amsterdam. Mm. Every comment at that moment is, di is directly shared with their network. So people see that these comments come from an audio event live or a live event and they can rejoin. So, and we did that 
with the audio event I did with Jasmine, where we went, we were uh, two weeks ago, we were at the same time in Bratislava speaking at the same conference. Yeah. And Jasmine invited me for an audio event about like, okay, how to create good content and how to get more reach on LinkedIn. So we did the event. We had 2000 people signing up prior to the event. And Jasmine said exactly the same in the beginning. He said like, okay, like uh, put up a, a thumbs or put up a, a heart because in an audio event, you can, well, you can write a comment on the post, but in the app, you can only like click on a uh, heart or click on a thumb. But if people do that, they engage with the event, sending out these mm. notifications to the network. So within half an hour, we had 4,000 people joining the audio event. So that was really spectacular. And I redid that tactic with uh, Ivana Todorovic from uh, Authored Up to launch our algorithm report last week, Tuesday. And we, again, reached 4,300 attendees with, a, with an audio event. And I got also 500 new followers just from that event, from people who have never heard of me but joined the event because of that. So I'm really a big fan of audio events more than LinkedIn Live because with a LinkedIn Live, you need to have, well, you know, you need to have your camera, you need to have your sound, you need to have your... Uh, like now, you need to have your third-party recording tool. But an audio event, it's so easy to create. You just open it with your mobile. You can literally do it walking your dog. Um, yeah. So it's, it's it's very easy to do, and it got a lot of traction. So I'm definitely going to do more audio events myself. Okay, you got me sold there. Yeah, got to do it. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> and can you say something about uh, like LinkedIn newsletters? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are some positive things. There are some like challenges. So the positive things is if you have a LinkedIn newsletter and you publish an article, LinkedIn sends out a notification to all the subscribers. Okay. So that, that's a good thing. Um, I didn't wrote, didn't write a newsletter for six months. Uh, it yeah. was May 23. And then I came back in November 23 to announce the algorithm report. And it was unbelievable because I remember that in May I had like 23,000 subscribers for my newsletter because you start with zero. Eh? You start, if you yeah. launch a newsletter, you have zero subscribers. It's not that you like directly have all your connection and followers. Ah. No, people need yeah. to click on the button like subscribe. So you start with zero. So I did some newsletters like two years. I reached 23,000 subscribers. I didn't do newsletters for six months. And when I came back in November, I saw 56,000 subscribers. And I was like, how? How did I grow 30,000 subscribers in yeah. six months without having published any newsletter? Now, the good thing is when people start to follow you and you have a newsletter, LinkedIn automatically sends out a notification to them like, Richard has a newsletter, subscribe. It's in your invite box. So mm. if you have a newsletter, each person that starts to follow you also gets the request from LinkedIn, do you want to subscribe? And since I grew my followers with 50,000, 30,000 of them selected, yes, I also want to follow. So that's, those are the positive things, okay? So you have LinkedIn helping you to get subscribers, you have the notifications, and also when we talk about SEO purposes, it's a very yeah. good thing. Okay, mm -hmm. SEO wise is a very good thing to write articles and newsletters. When it comes to organic reach within LinkedIn, it's very poor. So <laughs> uh, it, it, it's very poor compared to yeah. like the document posts or all types of yeah. other posts. Like it's almost like LinkedIn is like almost hiding them in a separate like place. Yeah. Um, so I write them to establish my thought leadership. I write them for my Google findability and I write them because I have substantial subscribers. I also had a tactic to, in each LinkedIn newsletter, I put a link to my email newsletter. So I also say like, hey, uh... except from my LinkedIn newsletter, I have a bi-monthly weekly emails newsletter and you can like click here. So I converted seven eight thousand people from linkedin to my email newsletter so that's also a very good tactic okay that's a really good tactic i think this is the interesting case because i was a little bit worried that it's a feature that maybe linkedin is not really uh convinced and they will take it down some at some point but if you really get it in your email list that is a, a smart move yeah and don't forget uh, uh 
articles, newsletters is rich data for LinkedIn because articles and newsletters have a lot of additional resources, additional media, hyperlinks, external links. So every person that publishes articles gives LinkedIn a lot of additional data, makes the platform more visible for Google. So I don't think they will kill the feature uh, very soon because it's a very valuable feature to do like reverse database building for their content. Yeah. Okay. Two last questions I got for you, Richard. First one is, it's always something that people ask a lot on my webinars, like what about hashtags? Should I do them in my content or not? Do you have some findings about them in your report? Well, if you, if, if you do them in the content, it's up to you. Um, yeah. I've stopped using them. There is no substantial increase in your reach using hashtags. The only thing where you can use them is to like uh, tag your content for a specific topics. So if I tag my content with a hashtag marketing, there is a possibility that people that are interested in marketing will find my content. However, that possibility is very low because if you scroll in your feed, the first 50 posts will not show any posts that are there because of your hashtag. And people yeah. normally don't scroll further than 50 posts. So um, LinkedIn, is, LinkedIn is also going to remove them from the top of the profile. So the creator mode hashtags are also going like are disabled. I really think that it's not a good marriage, LinkedIn and hashtags. It never been. <laughs> and I don't, I, I don't see anything positive happening in the, in the upcoming year. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, I take it because I'm not a huge, I'm not also in, in huge favor of them. So yeah, we, we get rid of them. So uh, last question, I'm really interested about it. It's a little bit looking into a crystal ball, but uh, some people that have been a long time on LinkedIn are already, oh, the chances to really like build something for yourself to get reach and content, it's already too late. Yeah, I think you've been on the platform for a lot of years. And I think in the last 18 months, you've seen it for yourself that you're growing, I think, like crazy. How do you see yourself or how do you see the future of LinkedIn? Are we just at the beginning of the platform or is it already the, the phase that it's getting really crowded and really competitive? Uh, there are a few things to your question. So first of all, if you look at the people that publish content on a weekly base, it's still 1.1%. Mm -hmm. So that means Crazy. that if you publish content, let's say twice a week, you outperform 99% of all the members. Okay. <laughs> That's so, a nice data. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and it's funny because if I tell people that, if I tell people who are not active on the platform that only 1% publishes content on a weekly base, yeah. you get two reactions. The first one is the people who get it and they go like, Hey, wow. So if I step up my game, I have this huge advantage and you have the other ones who say, so why should I? Because if 99% doesn't do anything, then I can also do it. So, okay, it's up to you. Um, I yeah. think with the right approach, with the right strategy, um, this is actually the best moment to grow your business on LinkedIn because yeah. um, you have so many additional tools compared to five years ago. Um, there is so much rubbish on LinkedIn that if you do the good things, you can stand out. You know, if yeah. you have this insightful content strategy, you will stand out from all the people who copy, paste, copy, paste, use AI or whatever. Um, so that for sure. However, I also worry a bit um, thinking about the trust and credibility of the platform. Mm -hmm. Because I know that more and more people that have been on LinkedIn from the first hour, so people that have been on LinkedIn more than 15 years, and also a lot of executive C-level, they now see LinkedIn as a platform where there is a lot of spam. There are a lot of like in-mails sent every day to people to try to sell them something on the first approach. It's not about what LinkedIn used to be, relationship building, networking. Yeah. It's just like sitting ducks. You know, we can target the people um, AI can really also harm the trust and credibility because if your post is written by a robot, your comments are coming from a robot, then, you know, yeah. where is the human element in that? Um, and I see, I don't know if LinkedIn doesn't realize this or if they don't care or maybe they're working at a solution, but I see more and more of my peers becoming a bit of fed up with making this effort in creating valuable content, which 
is a substantial yeah. resource of their time. And then their content gets like, I don't know, a thousand views and people who are gamifying the system using pods, engagement pods, automation, they get like much more visibility. So I think LinkedIn needs to fix that. They need to fix the balance between giving genuine content creators more reach and being much harder in punishing people who gamify the system. If they don't do that, I think it's going to be very tricky in a year or two years from now with the rise of AI and ports and automation yeah. where we are going to be. Yeah, I really like this. Yeah, very realistic approach to it. And I think it's up to LinkedIn to navigate it to really support like good content creators that are doing really a great job and yeah, keep away the spam and the DMs and the AI content. I really like that because yeah, if they can manage to do that, I think we all have a great future on this platform. Richard, Definitely. thank you so much for your time. It thank was you, very insightful. I know now what to do and thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for having me. In dem Interview sprechen wir immer wieder von Jasmine Alec, einem der größten Content Creator auf LinkedIn und den habe ich vor ein paar Monaten interviewen dürfen und den Link findest du hier. Wenn dir dieses Interview gefallen hat, dann sieh dir das Interview mit Jasmine unbedingt an. Da sind unglaublich viele Tipps und Tricks zusätzliche nochmal drin, die dich wirklich absolut begeistern werden und insofern sieh dir jetzt das Interview mit Jasmine an.